bomb dropped on Hiroshima. This was Britain's largest atomic test so far. Instead of sending the radioactive fallout out to sea, it went right across the whole of the northern half of Australia. A few days later, a technician on the other side of the continent was calibrating a Geiger counter for the Australian Air Force. On this particular day, um, I had one unit which would not respond to its normal calibration. Uh, its background was substantially higher than a normal background count. and. I walked around with a thing in my hand, thinking, what can it be, where have I gone wrong? And as I approached the window, the count started to increase. And I thought, it's strange, so I stepped back and it reduced. And then I got suspicious, so I started running the Geiger counter around the actual window frame. And I may add, it was raining cats and dogs in Brisbane at that particular time. Stuck it outside, and the count went off its rocker. And obviously we're having radioactive rain. Within one hour, a car turned up with a couple of officers, and they removed the Geiger counters we had there that we had repaired, as well as the radioactive material. And the owner of the business uh, informed me there that I had to, uh, not to mention to anyone or even talk about it, because that he was now under the Official Secrets Act. And uh, I never discussed with anybody since. That day, radioactive rain fell throughout Queensland. As much as the government tried, it could not contain the story. For the government, it was an absolute disaster because we have this prospector near Cloncurry bawling his billy as the story goes and his Geiger counter goes berserk. This prospector raises the alarm. It's not subject to the Official Secrets Act and it hits the national press. Now, the Minister of Supply, Howard Beale, has written in his autobiography, it could have lost him his job. So it was a massive problem for the government. Meanwhile, fresh animal thyroids were arriving at Marston's laboratory from across the nation. The thyroids were put into the radiation counter. The results were noted. And they were hot. I, I alone had the results, which were hot. The claims of atomic rain were true. Iodine levels in animal thyroids were up to 4,000 times higher than expected. The fallout area was enormous, ranging from Alice Springs in central Australia to Rockhampton on the northeast coast of the continent. I rang Professor Martin, who was a member of the Australian Safety Committee. He, he doesn't want to know. It was awful. The data was sent to London, to the scientific mastermind of the tests, Sir William Penny. The telegram stated bluntly, there may be political danger. But according to the British, the radioactive iodine levels were well within safe levels and there was no danger to the Australian population. Headley had a heart attack and was in hospital during the time that these results were coming. His assistant came to me and pleaded with me not to tell him, which I didn't do. He came out of hospital and was absolutely furious that he hadn't been told. 
On his return to the laboratory, Marston secretly recorded a conversation with the safety committee chairman, Leslie Martin. He accused the committee and the British and Australian governments of lying to the population. Les, this is getting just beyond the damn joke. Have things got away from you? We took in good faith there was no fallout on the continent. Well, it was official report coming from the minister. You must have the paper clippings from about that time and there's no possible harm to befall anybody. It is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen and that will make every scientist indignant and I should imagine stir up the socialists. We just lack confidence in anybody now. Hadley didn't like physicists. But physicists were beginning to pronounce on biological matters. That is the impact of radiation on, and the hazard of radiation in the human population. How dare they, thought Hadley. Marston's doctor ordered him to cut back on his workload. But he was determined to continue his experiments to see if the safety committee was looking after British or Australian interests. He expanded his thyroid collection points around Adelaide, the closest city to the tests. And unknown to the safety committee, he would also monitor radioactivity in the air over the city. Fortunately, an American scientist, Professor Perry Stout, had set up a rather splendid piece of equipment the year before to measure natural radioactivity in the air over Adelaide. Perry invented this uh, filtering device which would suck 20 or 30 litres of air through uh, a filter pad which would sift out anything radioactive, they then simply measured that with a Geiger counter. And he did that up on the, uh, the roof of the nutrition laboratory in Adelaide. He plans to use that just in case the city was contaminated. South Australia, September the 27th, 1956, 5 p.m. South Australian time. Letter to Mark Oliphant, private and confidential. Oh, my dear Mark, I'm more worried than I can convey about the expensive quasi-scientific pantomime that's being enacted at Maralinga under the cloak of secrecy. And even more so about the evasive lying that is being indulged in by public authorities about the hazard of fallout. I nearly blow a gasket every time I think of it. Apparently, Whitehall and Canberra consider that the people of Northern Australia are expendable. By comparison to all its predecessors, the third Maralinga test was small. Politically, it was the most explosive.